Psalm chapter 41. And Lord, you are a good, good Father. It's, it's who you are. And we, Lord God, are loved by you. It's because it's who we are. We are your creation, Lord, and you love us. And so we thank you for that. And we thank you that you gave us the ability and even the sensibility to respond to your goodness. Not everyone has done that, of course, Lord. In fact, the majority of this world rejects you. So we thank you, Lord God, that as you called us, Lord, you gave us the ability to respond properly. And so what a blessing. And so now, Lord, we want to mature. Our heaven and hell issue has been resolved through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We understand that. But now, Lord God, through the study of your word, we want to know more and more about who you are, not only to benefit ourselves, but to be able to properly present you, Father God, to a dying world. It's just right outside these doors, Lord. So again, teach us tonight. Calm us. We want to be anxious for nothing. We do not want to lean on our own understanding. We want to allow you to guide our paths. So we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather this evening. So again, Father God, speak to us through your word, through these groupings of psalms that, we've, that you've selected for us tonight, Father God. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 41. Now, Psalm 41 is possibly written toward the end of David's life. And, and if it's not written toward the end of David's life, it was inserted into the collection of the Psalms toward the end of David's life because it was coherent at that time. But yet, I call this a contemplation of the betrayed. The con contemplation of the betrayed. Have you ever been betrayed, felt like you've been left out? Well, join the club, because that's just the way life is, because there is a world out there that hates us, and we are on the end of their criticism. And it can be tough. And so contemplation of the betrayed, and, and Jesus even knew with his own disciples, those that cried out to him, he knew, I, I, don't, I, I don't put any, any long-term understanding in, in mankind. I put my faith in my Father. And that's what we sang tonight. He is a good, good Father. And so as we're going to see these next couple of psalms, we're going to see there's an opportunity for each and every one of us to choose joy. Joy is a choice. We can either choose to be overweighted with the weight of the world, or we can choose to have the joy of the Lord. And it is a choice, and we're going to see that tonight. So I would pray that all of us would today, tonight, starting tonight, if we already, already haven't, but today, and from these days forth, choose joy. I didn't say happiness or, or anything like that. Joy, the joy of the Lord. Be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. And David is going to remind himself of all the things that Jehovah God had done for him. Even though David was in a, a tough time. But he's going to begin to reflect in verse 1 as he starts out, Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. So isn't that interesting? Blessed is he who considers the poor. So don't neglect the poor is what David is realizing. And again, it's, it's perhaps toward the end of his life that these, I, the, these thoughts are coming through. The Lord will always deliver. And David might be on his sickbed at this time just saying, hey, the Lord will deliver. So don't disregard the poor. Consider the, the poor, for the Lord will deliver you in your time of need. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You, Lord, will not deliver him to the will of his enemies, Yes, the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him 
on his sick bed. This whole idea of paying it forward is kind of the contemporary way we look at that right now. Have you heard of that idea, pay it forward? Well, kind of in a way, David is just saying, hey, consider the poor, and, and again, in your time of need, the Lord will consider you. And so that's a pretty good investment, is what David is saying, as he's kind of reflecting. And he goes on and says in verse 4, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul. And here it is. Here's that theme again that we've been seeing week after week. For I have sinned against you. And again, there goes the idea of, well, because I'm under grace, I can go ahead and sin. And David here is a perfect example of saying, my sin is dragging me down. Because the Lord cannot face my sin. I mean, my sin has to be washed away. And so that whole idea of, it, of that idea of people saying, well, I'm a born again Christian, and sometimes we have to question that. But I'm a Christian, and how far can I push the envelope until I'm really at odds with the Lord? And that doesn't seem to be the right thing to say. It should be the other way. How generously can I bring to the Lord his desires to be glorified and qualified to a dying world? Instead of becoming like the world, how can I be more set apart? How can I be more reflective of, the, of Jesus Christ? How can I do that? Instead of how much can I kind of get away with? And David is saying this is not good because heal me, Lord, be merciful to me. For, to me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. And again, that's been very consistent in the last several weeks. David is, is admitting his own sin and, and teaching us, really, through his life that sin has a price. Don't go down that path. And so David continues as he's floundering in his sin, and he says, My enemies speak evil of me, saying... When will he die and his name perish? And so the non-believers liked this idea that this godly man was sickly, David, and they were saying, great, we want this guy to die because that'll help us remove the name of Jehovah from our lives. Because while he's alive, uh, this, this guy reminds us that there's a living God that knows all things. And so the quicker he dies, the better off we're going to feel in our sin. And so David is saying, how long will my enemies speak evil of me and wish for me my death? Verse 6, and if my enemy comes to see me, David continues, he speaks lies. And yet his heart gathers iniquity to itself. So we can either gather the blessings of the Lord when we consider the poor, or David on the flip side is saying, when they come to attack me, oh, they're attacking me, but yet they're also stacking up iniquity for their own future. Interesting. He speaks lies and his heart gathers iniquity to itself. When he goes out, he tells of it. In other words, he sees David in his sick bed and he runs out downtown and says, oh, hey, man, David doesn't look good. He may die soon. Oh, hey, that's great news type thing. And so that's what David is saying. He goes out and he tells what he's seen. All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me, they devise my hurt. So all the evildoers are kind of congregating and devising evil. An evil disease, they say, clings to him. And now that he lies down, he will rise up no more. And so David is saying, it's my sin that has tripped me up. And so David is just saying, man, Lord, what was I thinking when I engaged in that sinful activity? Now I'm bringing blasphemy to your name, Lord. And that is grating on David tremendously. And he goes on to say, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That would be easy to understand that 
That would be something speaking about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. Uh, Judas Iscariot. Very good possibility there. But, but David is speaking. He's speaking about his own circumstance. Was this a prophecy for the future? Who knows? But yet we remember that David, again, was being mocked and being ridiculed previously by King Saul and actually chased down for his life. And then eventually Absalom, his own son, desiring his own dad's life. And so David had some issues here. But you, O Lord, in verse 10, you, Lord, no one else is, but you, Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me because my enemy does not triumph over me. My enemy's will will not become coming to my doorstep this day. My enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you, Lord, uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. David, as we know, a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he repented of his sin continually. And God heard that prayer. He said, David, I know you're, you're but, but dust. And that's why I'm going to carry you, because you can't do it. And David humbled himself continually under that and, and repented. And the result here, once again, you uphold me in my integrity. First of all, my sin was, was weighing me down. But we can see here during that time of David's writing, he repented. He said, Lord, forgive me. And the Lord met him right there. He said, David, you're forgiven. And so you'll uphold me in my integrity. The integrity that the Lord brought. The integrity of the Lord. And you have set me before your face forever. We have got to remember that that is where we are headed. This world is not where we end. We are designed and waiting to be set before God's face forever. Let's, let's have that in our mindset a lot more. I know it's there. But sometimes we need to dust that off a little more often, right? I mean, because so often we just invest in this life and we think, oh, all is lost. When something happens, oh, no, what am I going to do now? It's over. It's, all, it's not even begun. We have not even started. Wait till we're in the millennial reign, reigning with Jesus, man. That's going to be a great time. And that's, that's just the beginning of, of, our, of our lives. And so David finally says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Let it be so. David is making that proclamation. Let it be so. And then put another punctuation on it. God is, from etern is, is eternal. And so how exciting that is. As we've just completed Psalm 41, obviously, Psalm 1 through 41 compile what we call book number one of the Psalms, okay? It would appear that the Hebrew writers or, or those that collected the, the Torah and the Psalms together, the first five books, the Torah, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books... And then the, the Psalms, the, uh, the, the high priest, they seemed to collect the Psalms and also broke them up into five books, perhaps mimicking the idea of the first five books of Moses, perhaps. We don't really know, but what we do know is Psalms, Psalm 1 through 41 completes what we recognize, the Hebrew uh, scholars recognize as book number one of the Psalms. Now, in book number one of the Psalms, 1 through, through 41, up to now, David has been our author exclusively. Every psalm has been, given, given, has been credited by David, or there was no credit at all. So we can just reasonably say, up to now, David has been our author in book number one here. Book number two, the sons of Korah, Asaph, and eventually Solomon. 
These folks are going to be introduced to us in book number two. And starting in Psalm 42, we're going to see that this is written to the chief, it, it was given to the chief musician, yet it's a contemplation of the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah. So this is a brand new author, actually a group of authors. You know, several sons or two sons, two or more sons of Korah. So interesting. So it's a brand new kind of a shift. And, and so therefore we go into book number two of the Psalms being introduced to some new, new authors. Now, the sons of Korah, we remember back in Numbers chapter 16. Korah wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Moses. And that was a huge mistake because you remember back in Numbers 16 that Moses said, hey, Korah, you better be careful because something big's going to happen to you. And sure enough, after Moses explained to Korah, you need to step down, Korah, and Korah didn't, we remember the earth opened up. And Korah went down to the center of the earth, literally, and those who followed Korah in the rebellion, all those folks and their things, too, were swallowed up. And then the earth closed back up. Can you imagine witnessing something like that? I mean, people were just running for their lives, literally. I don't blame them. We would have done the same thing. <laughs> But Korah was the one the Lord, Korah and his entourage was, what the, was the group that the Lord was after. Now Korah's sons, it's suggested, this is just a suggestion, it is suggested, suggested that these sons, Korah's sons were so young, they were old enough to see what had happened, but yet they were young enough to still be pure in heart, even though their dad was out being a goofball, their dad's sin was not accounted to the sons of Korah. That's the suggestion. And so now we see the contemplation of the sons of Korah. Now it took seven generations of Korah's family line, if you will, family genealogy until, until the name of Korah kind of resurfaced and and. and we see that after seven generations, we remember Samuel. Well, he was a son of Korah, if we follow it back. But it took, we didn't hear anything from Korah and his family for seven generations. Again, until Samuel arrived on the scene as a little boy. And so that just kind of connects, hopefully, a little more understanding of these sons of Korah. So these, these boys were not charged with their dad's goofiness. And so these sons were able to, even, I mean, the, the, the kids, the grandkids, the great-grandkids, etc., were able to grow up. And now we find the sons of Korah. So let's pick up at verse 1. And, and these sons of Korah, they were marvelous and very skilled worship leaders for King David. They were skilled musicians and they were skilled music writers. And we're going to see that skill right here in verse 1. And you're familiar with the verse, as the deer pants for the water, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Isn't that an amazing word picture? We see these men are skilled. We see that David saw these, these guys with that skill, that God-given skill, and David said, hey, you're with me. You're on the, the, the King David praise writing team. And David knew, knew what he was doing. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. Man, that is just melodic. My soul thirsts for, for God, for the living God. Now when shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Isn't that an amazing line? My tears have been my food day and night. I mean, just a constant 
wailing and mourning. My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? This psalm is yearning for God as we see in the midst of distress and we have to ask ourselves and it would appear that this may be, and again, these are just suggestions we don't 100% know, but through reasonable consideration, this is very possibly the time when Absalom was chasing after his dad. And David had to hurry out of the city of David and his entourage went with him. And so his musicians went with him and they're recording this in po in poetically. And so, where is your God is the cry for those who chase me down is Absalom again. David's son was trying to kill his own father. Verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. Reflecting on the time, the peaceable times when David was ruling. For I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. So the reflections, as they're on the run, as they're on the lamb, as they're in the middle of the wilderness, they're reflecting and they're jotting these things down, recording them. Much like people do today, they pull out their phone and they video something that's going on. It's for the record. And so that's what these sons of Korah are doing. These, these poem writers, these psalm writers, they're jotting these things down. This is David's history. This is the history of the king of Israel. He's on the run. And so we're reflecting. And so they're probably listening to David as he's crying out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, what's going on? And they're, they're, just, they're jotting all these things down. We remember we used to go with a multitude, etc., to the pilgrim feast. Verse 5. But then... David reflects and he, and he counsels himself. I love this. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Now David had every reason to be cast down, but guess what? He chose joy. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And I love that when we're able to counsel ourselves. Really, it's the Holy Spirit counseling us. But I like to personalize it just a little bit. I want to counsel myself. Man, oh, oh soul, why are you down? Man, you're heaven bound. So what's the problem here? What is the problem? Oh my God, verse 6, my soul is cast down within me, therefore. So he's acknowledging, I am down and since I acknowledge that, therefore, I won't sit for this. I will remember you from the land of the Jordan and from the heights of Hermon, from the hill of Mizar. These are all places that David is being reminded of who the Lord is. The Mount, Mount Hermon, the heights of Hermon, where the Lord would dwell. And the area, the hills and things. And it's funny, when you, when you go to Israel, and someday you will, either physically or spiritually, but it's funny, when Pastor and I, we went, and we started looking around, we're thinking, oh man, we're going to look at, at, at Mount Hermon, we're going to see Mount Moriah, and I'm thinking there's going to be these, these scaling huge mountain ranges, you know, I'm thinking, and I spent eight years in, in uh, Utah and just seeing all the, the landscape. And I'm thinking, oh, these mountains must just be out of sight. You know, and we get to Israel, and they're little bitty, little bitty guys, little dinky things. You know, kind of like the foothills around here. I'm like, you know, these are foothills, and that's fine. But when I see the mount of God and all this sort of stuff, and the hill and this and that and the other thing, I'm expecting these grand things. And they're just little thousand foot, little... And hills. Um, but they're the Lord's. But it was funny to me. I mean, I was just kind of cracking myself up. I mean, I'm not trying to be critical. But it was just funny. But yet these are the memories. David is recalling his memories, reminding himself of God's goodness. 
Yeah, we're on the, on the run right now. Yeah, we're having a lot of problems, but I choose. I choose to remember God's goodness. The poetry continues in verse 7. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. All your waves and billows have gone over me in a way of comfort. Not in a way that I'm being drowned, I'm being drowned, but in a way of comfort. David is, is, is realizing, Lord, you are good, and the guys are writing this down. Oh, this is the way David is being comforted by God's power. Deep cries unto deep, and the billows have gone over me in a comforting way. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Mocking, ridiculing, and David is just filled with it. Yet he concludes, after all this, he asks himself, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? There's no reason for this. Oh, sure, temporarily, you lost your mind for a moment or something, but now that the remembrance of the Lord has come back into your thinking, now, why are you cast down, O oh, oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope is in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. We need to be broken to that position, to that depth, to that measure, that the only thing that we can do is just look up and praise the Lord. That's pure worship. That's what it's all about. And that's where David finds himself and desires to educate us tonight, and we're grateful. And we'll finish up with Psalm 43, just a few verses. The whole psalm is just a few verse, verses. This is a prayer to God in time of trouble. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Sometimes I think we need to plead our own cause as Christians in the United States in the midst of an ungodly nation. And I'm sorry that I have to say that. I love the United States. I'm glad to be an American. But my goodness, we are just in the midst of ungodly leaders. I mean, we just are. And we're, we're, we're looked at worldwide as an ungodly nation. The United States used to be looked at a nation that was godly and with pure motives and things. But now, I mean, with some of our leadership now, there are many countries that just hate us. I mean, we're called by many countries the great Satan. I mean, it's totally different than the godly nation that we might have once been. I, you know, I, I'm not sure, but I'm talking about right now. I mean, we are being led. We are an ungodly nation. But thank God for the, for the minority, praise the Lord, but we are in a minority and such. And so it's just, it's a crazy thing. And so I plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. Now, we've got to be praying for our leadership. And sometimes we find that hard to do, don't we? I mean, we're all in the same boat. We find it hard to pray for some of our ungodly leaders. When's the last time you prayed for our governor? Yeah, the last time you thought of our governor, you, you did one of these in your mind, didn't you? That's right. That's what we do. Our senators and some of our legislators, we've done a lot of this when we think of them. 
But as Paul tells us in the book of Romans, as we're going to continue to view that, we need to pray for these folks. They don't have a chance without our prayers. And we need to diligently pray for these ungodly leaders. That's our only hope. Lord, touch this person. Touch this man. Touch this woman. Wake them up. Lord, you're their only hope. And, that's our, and you, Lord, are our, are our only hope here in California and here in the, in the United States. And so it's a tough job. I mean, it's a laborious job to pray for these <laughs> knuckleheads. But man, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so God help us in that regard. We are an ungodly nation and an ungodly state for that matter. Send, your light, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let your light and your truth lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle as we've gathered here tonight. Then, once I get my head straight, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Choose joy, man. Choose joy. My God, my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O oh God, my God. I will worship you. I will adore you. The word worship simply means, in its very base translation, it means a kiss. So do you realize when we're worshiping the Lord, we're desiring to kiss the cheek of the Lord. That's what we're doing. And that's how he accepts it. He accepts us like, yes, come in. Oh, you have something? Oh, oh thank you. Right? When we, when we see our kids or our grandkids and they come up and they hug us and give us a smooch, we go, oh, we receive that, don't we? And then when we're worshiping, that's exactly what God is doing. He's like this saying, come on in. I'll receive it. Oh, and you've got a kiss for me on top of that. Well, you just made my day. And that's exactly what David is saying. I will praise you. I will embrace you, Lord, with the skill that you've given me. And I will return it to you. And I will embrace you, O oh God, my God. And so he concludes, David concludes, so therefore, why are you cast down Oh, my soul. This is the exact thing Psalm 42 ended with. And we're going to end Psalm 43, the exact same thing. Why are you cast down, oh, my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. What a blessing. Great opportunity to come together tonight and be uplifted be reminded and be refreshed. To be able to be re-equipped in the middle of the week to go back out and express that joy of the Lord and be motivated by the joy of the Lord, be matured by the joy of the Lord, be able to know that I get to choose how I respond. And what a blessing that's truly been tonight. If I could ask the team to come join me, what a blessing to do so. Once again, we'll be meeting, just a, a quick reminder, I, I think sometimes it's important for us to be reminded, we will be meeting as a, the Grief Support Ministry this Sunday. If you know anyone that would benefit from that, it's a wide open group, okay? So invite, and do even more than invite, bring. And we just kind of hang out, we allow the Lord to minister, and it's a wonderful thing. And so that's what we'll be uh, looking at uh, the end of second service. Uh, we're in Romans chapter 3. We'll finish up Romans chapter 3. And this is really the heart of the gospel we'll look at Sunday morning. What it is that God requires and what it is that Jesus did for you and I. What he did for us. And I know that we're born again, men and women, family here. We're close-knit family. But we need to have an understanding, a little better understanding of what it is the Lord's done for us. So when someone asks us, we can represent it a little bit better. We do it well, don't misunderstand. But it's like anything, we wanna practice and we wanna get better.
at what it is we're, we're to do. Amen. And so we'll really see that. We'll see the nuts and bolts, literally, Sunday, the heart of the gospel. Romans chapter 3. Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your kindness. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. Father God, you are love. And we just thank you, Father God. And so as we recognize you this evening going out with that worship song, we recognize you, Father God, as the cornerstone. And without a cornerstone, nothing can be built. But Jesus, you are the cornerstone of our salvation, and you will build our lives accordingly. It's because you love us, and it's because you desired to spend eternity with us. So thank you, Lord, cornerstone. Join us by standing. Let's praise our Lord.